Эн бол BMW-ийн хосолсон хөдөлгөөртэй XM загвар. BMW компани нь анх 1970 онд M загварын автомашиныг үйлдвэрлэж эхэлсэн төвөгтэй. BMW XM гэх энэхүү цоошин загварын автомашин нь BMW X цувралын бат бүх практик байдлыг M цувралын өндөр гүйсгэлтэй хослуулснаар тансаг зорим хийх маягийг шингээжээ. 2023 онд үйлдвэрлэгдсэн тус загвар 100 км цаг хурдыг 4.3 секундэнд авдаг байна. Маш хүчтэй бөгөөд оновчтой бүх дугуун хөтлөгч өндөр мэдрэмжтэй идэвхжүүлэгчдээр суурилсан дугуун гулсалтын хязгаарлагч зэрэг нь домогт AM загварын шинж тэмдэг болох хүч оновчтой жолоодлогыг энхүү илэрхийлж байгаа билээ. 2017 онд байгуулагдсан Bavaria Motors нь дэлхийн тэргүүлэх зэрэглийн BMW компани автомашинуудыг Монголд цор ганц албан ёсны эрэгтэйгээр оруулж ирдэг байна. Тансаг дэй зэрэглийн BMW XM загвар нь аюулгүй байдал, инновацлог шийдлийг шингээж өгснөөрө хэрэглэгчдийн таашаал хэдийнээ нийцэд байгаа юм. Энэ дугаарын зочид бол хот дах хөгжлийн банкны гүйсдэх захирал орхон болон Бүгд найрамдах Франц улсаас Монгол улсад цуух онц бөгөөд бүрэн эрэхт элчин сайд асан Себастьян Сүрүн юм. Okay, Mr. Ambassador, please tell our viewers about yourself. How you know where you born and how you got to Mongolia and right. where have you been? So I've been here three years now. Um, I arrived uh, with the end of COVID, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Right. Um, I, I was actually very willing to come here, um, partly because you know Mongolia has this great image of the steppe and the open space, uh, but I knew there was also uh, uh, on any map of the region, whether it's democracy, human rights, death penalty, uh, membership in the International Criminal Court. You have whatever color and mm -hmm. you have Mongolia in a different color. Right, uh, right. It's not always brilliantly green, uh, sometimes a bit yellow, but in an ocean of mm -hmm. red, it always stands out. Um, and throughout my career, I've always managed to be in places that are between two worlds, right. um, that are a connection. Mm -hmm. Uh, or it could be a point of tension, or it could be somewhere where things happen more easily. Um, and I think Mongolia is one of these places that manages to create space for themselves. Right. So I've been happy here. We've been happy. We, my, my wife joined me here, uh, and, and uh, we've traveled throughout the country. We've met incredible people. Uh, we've had yeah a very, very interesting three years. Um, so before that, I'm a career diplomat. So I, I chose this job 27 years ago. Right. Uh, and I served, as I said, in, in many different places, but the common thread would probably be uh, places that are connecting different worlds, connecting different, uh, different spaces. What's your embassy's main role or what, what you have done really during your, your time here? Well, let's start first of all with the foreign affairs. Yeah, lots of things happened during during your term here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we were, we were blessed with uh, two state visits. The first ever visit of a French president to yes. Mongolia, um, and I can tell you that he was very happy with what he saw. Uh, I drove with him a bit like here, so he was sitting here. I was right. sitting there, back to the airport in the middle of the night, and um, he, he, he was surprised in a good way. He knew that he would have proactive, reactive interlocutors, but um, it was even more than he was expecting. Yeah. Uh, and then they met, that was in May last year, and then they met, met again in October last year That's when right. Pedro Asuch visited France. Yeah. That visit was longer. Uh, it was uh, only one of two state visits in France this year. Uh, the other one was King Charles of England. Right. Uh, and a state visit is it's beautiful because it's it's a protocol, it's beautiful events, but it's also meaningful. It happens for a reason. Yeah, sure. uh, it's not the starting point it's of a relationship. It's a historic one, yeah? yeah. Because things were mature enough for that. Mm -hmm. uh, because our level of engagement was, was strong enough. Uh, and then, of course, it creates more um, obligations, more 
basically more work for for people like me. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I think it's, it's a nice problem to have. Uh, so these two visits were, were were the more visible part of how much our, our cooperation and how much our, our discussion as nations has has, has evolved. But there's also a, 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 a fundament of, of cooperation we have, which we try and make and, and turn to the service of populations. Uh, what is the most visible is our cooperation with civil security, with NEMA. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and that is working extremely well. Uh, it's training, it's equipment, uh, it's thinking together about doctrine, uh, how do you fight uh, white fires, how do you fight fires in industrial sites. Yeah. Um, and the feedback we have from the French instructors coming here mm -hmm. uh, is that they, they, they are impressed uh, by how, again, how quickly people learn, learn but yeah. also how they challenge you. And they just don't say, well, you, you've taught us something, thank you very much, you've taught us that. But in this situation, that doesn't work here. So mm -hmm. how should we adapt it? How should we make it our own? Um, and that's why we decided to have a new phase of this cooperation. Um, that, that is one of the many, many uh, um, uh, population-oriented projects we have because um, we want to show that democracies deliver. Uh, that taking that time of discussing, uh, of planning together, uh, and of making sure that it is serving the interests of the border population makes a difference. Um, that is also one of the rationals behind our projects for the cable car. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll get back to, to, to it once we're out of this little traffic jam here. And uh, it's also behind uh, the next bigger project we have, which is a telecommunication satellite, which a French-Italian company will build for Mongolia, right. so that there is a sovereign national telecommunication satellite. Uh, Mongol engineers will decide if they want to move it a bit here, have more capacity there because it could be a natural disaster, or here because they know they have more clients for big festival, for Nadam for example. Right. Uh, and no one will decide outside of Mongolia what to do with the data, uh, whether it would be available, what the prices will be, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that will make good quality telecommunication accessible throughout the country uh, for as cheap as, as, uh, as possible and again it would be the government deciding how cheap they want to go uh, what offers they want to they want to make energy the lack of energy is becoming now a huge huge problem in Mongolia of course we have lots of coal but no one is now financing or building any uh, new uh, coal firing power mm. plants. How do you see? Uh, the role of the government there, what, what policies do you, do, you, do you expect from, from, from the government? In terms of foreign of, trade or uh, in, in, in terms of, of economic development? Well, of course, it's, it's, it's very important, that, uh, especially the, you know, the tax policies, uh, the, the different sector policies, mm -hmm. and then uh, the policies on foreign uh, direct investment, to, uh, how to attract it, and then, you know, all sorts of uh, economic policies that either sometime prevent. We've seen a very, you know, big uh, fall in the for FDI, and then or some in, uh, in some policies can really create a uh, good environment mm -hmm. for foreign investment. Why I'm saying always foreign investment is because obviously we need capital. We need we need money. We, money comes with know-how, with new technologies with, you know, people training, you know, Mongolians. And o OT is one of the, you know, best uh, performing examples of that, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's, it's, it's uh, trained so many Mongolians, it's created so many jobs and then so many, so such a big, 
huge supply chain yeah. for the country and lots of exports and this is all you know helping so this is this is the reason why i always try to try to support and attract foreign investment mm -hmm. not only in the financial sector but for our customers across across you know all, all the sectors not not only mining but also and that's why i'm really proud of this uh, you know the uh, careful uh, chain like when, when it, it came to mongolia it's, it's it's again one of the great great uh, examples mm. of that uh, talking about large projects ot yeah. we were waiting for the next ot project yeah. for yeah. quite long time and it looked like to me that it's finally moving during uh, during your term uh, it is moving. The discussions have started uh, for an investment agreement between the French company called Orano, mm -hmm. uh, and what they do is, is uh, extracting natural uranium. Um, they do not transform it into fuel here, but they right. just extract it. Uh, and that investment agreement would be with, with the government of Mongolia. Uh, when that happens, that would be the second largest foreign investment in the country. Yeah. That's what we're, we all expect. Yeah, we're talking about 1.6 mm -hmm. billion uh, euros over 30 euros. years. There is something very different from OT in terms of technology. It's small scale. Mm -hmm. um, technology is called uh, in situ leaching, which means uh, actually there's a picture of the project, the pilot project, uh, on, on the walls outside the, of the embassy. Oh, and it's always a surprise to people saying, but. Where's the hole? Where is you know? Where, where are you digging? Well, they're not digging. Mm -hmm. uh, they are injecting a solution oh, uh, in the ground, and then pumping it a few dozens meters uh, uh, away. So it's it's a slow process, and then they are extracting the uranium and recycling it. Uh, so what you see is small pools, uh, maybe that high up on the surface. And that's it. And that's so you have the herds going around, you don't have trucks, you don't have dust. Uh, and that is the technology we've used in Kazakhstan for the last 10 years. I see. Uh, and, and, and they were travels organized by uh, officials from Mongolia and herders from Mongolia to go and see what it looks like in 10 years. Right. Uh, and, and it's always a surprise because oh, there's so little to see. Um, but that would help make the uranium market more fluid throughout the world mm -hmm. and, and many countries, uh, not just France, have uh, um, a vast fleet of, of, uh, of uh, nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. um, you can use a bit of radioactivity in all sorts of scientific and medical devices, but nuclear energy has that huge advantage of producing almost, little, almost no uh, CO2 to produce energy. You need a bit of CO2 to build the, the, the power plant, yes. like any big building, uh, and then that's it. Which is why you have more and more countries turning to nuclear energy. Uh, historically, Russia is a big actor as well, China in the region. Japan has had uh, a more complicated history with nuclear energy, of course. Um, Europe, the US, uh, more and more countries, Middle East, uh, Korea, are, are, are turning their eyes to nuclear energy as one of the elements of an energy mix. No one says it, it solves every single problem or every single demand, but it, it's, it's a good part of a varied energy mix with renewables uh, and with, to some extent, uh, fossil fuel, uh, with more fuel, fuel uh, um, efficiency, with more energy efficiency, and, and um, that makes for a fluid market and a bigger market for uranium, so we hope we can seize the moment, uh, and and I hope that the the discussions will restart with the new government, with the new coalition, so that we can you know, send that signal to investors that yes, you can have big investments in Mongolia again, um, including in mining, if it's environmentally. Uh, friendly, if uh, it's beneficial to the population, uh, if uh, it, it's respecting the landscapes, then there is a possibility to, to, to think bigger. And um, I don't have a timetable time in, in mind, but what I know about the discussion itself is that mm -hmm. there is no big issue. 
There's no... There's no outstanding, any big issue to be resolved or misunderstanding no, between two parties. No, no issue where it has to be black or white. Right. Many issues where it uh, should be 100 or 200, 120 or maybe 160. That can be negotiated around. Fine tuning. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but the, the basic principles have been set on paper already in October of last year I when uh, the Mongol president visited France. So we know where we're going. We understand that there's also a need of, of building a consensus, of having um, local populations, local uh, MPs, uh, having uh, local partners informed, they have legitimate questions, there are answers. Uh, the Mongol Academy of Sciences mm -hmm. made a very good work in assessing the current state of wildlife, soils, water and the impact of the project. Uh, so that makes us comfortable to say we, we've had that discussion, uh, everyone knows in a very transparent way what is on the table, let's wrap it up in, in the shape of an investment agreement uh, and, and start operations in, in, in a few years from now. And as you say, that will bring expertise, that will bring investment, that will bring uh, job opportunities. Yes. And we start to see bright Mongol engineers and technicians working for Rano. Yeah. Um, I visited the, the, the site two years ago for the first time uh, with the then um, uh, mining minister. And every time he had a question, he had a Mongol engineer answering yeah, him. Uh, <laughs> there, there are three non-Mongols in the whole company, as far as I know. Right. And, and that is the ratio that we're looking at in the future. There would be more people, uh, but mostly more Mongols working there in more and more qualified jobs. And I'm quite confident that in 10 years from now, you will see Mongol specialists working in projects for this company or elsewhere, uh, anywhere in the world. Yeah, I really hope the new joint government will make it happen because mm -hmm. they have it on, uh, on their joint agenda to really start or develop, continue these big projects mm -hmm. in mining sector, in urbanization, in human development, you know, a lot of lots of talks. Where, but as you say, it in Mongolia, things sometimes slowly, sometimes fast but things should happen you know should should finally happen and then keep keep moving so now we have this Mon go mongolia always moving yeah, the new in, the new image of the country now so yeah. i think the new joint government will 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 do a lot so mm. hopefully fingers crossed this uh, the second largest investment and in project will will finally you know start because uh, I um, mean, energy, the lack of energy is becoming you know, a huge, huge problem in Mongolia. Of course, yeah, we have yeah. lots of coal, but no one's now financing or building any uh, new uh, coal firing power mm -hmm. plants. So we need, of course, we have lots of potential for renewable energy, but everything has its limit, you know. So I think uh, this is a very important uh, project for Mongolia. My personal opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's going to take time to produce and you know build, etc. But in the longer future, I think that that would be the future of Mongolian energy. That's my yeah. hope. So end of next year, there will be a cable car from Khachorin Market mm -hmm. to Yarmak. It's the only big transport project that is actually financed. So you said your wife is a musician? Yes, she's a famous, famous actor. Mm -hmm. Now though she's a part of a girl band. 
for over 20 years now. What is that thing Mongols have with music? Uh, because maybe I've told you the story. Before being a candidate for the job mm -hmm. here, I asked a colleague of mine who used to be ambassador here maybe six years ago. And she told me the most surprising thing here is the music scene, because you have traditional music, um, M-pop, jazz, classical music, opera, mm -hmm. uh, live music everywhere. And it's all mixed. You have the same people doing different types of music, mm -hmm. which in Europe you no longer have. People mm -hmm. are very specialized. Right. Uh, and I've been so happy here for three years with the music scene. So what is the thing with, with, with music for, for Mongols? That it's always there and it's always creative and always um, alive in a way. Yeah, we, we love music. Music is everywhere, whether it's traditional music, classical music or modern mm. music. All our corporate events, customer events, the New Year parties, even the you know, weddings, they all mm. with music. So we have uh, lots of famous artists and, and groups, bands in the, in the country which like keep visiting yeah. all those events. Through, throughout the whole entire year, so we, we see them everywhere. You know, like you know, sometimes in uh, you know towards mm. the end of the year when we have lots of corporate parties, we we can see them every night. Yeah, there's one category of music that is well not not well known here, which is baroque music, mm -hmm. um, and we were able to have a baroque orchestra. They were visiting Asia, and we were able to have them here for 24 hours including a master class and they were they are attached to the um, uh, Royal Opera in Versailles which is where there was a very beautiful uh, Mongol music concert when President Khorosuk visited Paris oh, yeah, in yeah. October. The same guys, mm -hmm. um, they, they moved here mm -hmm. for once and I hope to have them here at some point next year and I saw how surprised and engaged the audience was here and then when I talked to the musicians mm -hmm. They said, well, we felt it on stage, that people were surprised because of sounds and rhythms mm -hmm. uh, that are very unusual for the classic music uh, uh, heritage here, mm -hmm. uh, because it's 17th, early 18th century music. It, it's very, very Pepsi. It is very, um, um, a bit like, um, uh, you know, the, the Step Awakens here, and that, that kind of, of, uh, of, of music with a lot of rhythm. Mm -hmm. And, and that was a good surprise for everyone to, to see that discovery, to mm -hmm. see a good audience meeting a good orchestra and, 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 and each discovering something. It's a ni nice view from, from here into the city. I think at this time of the year is when you don't have too much traffic jam, so it's, uh, it, it, it looks more, more viable in a way. But if we were sitting on the other side, uh, I could have shown you the place where we will install the cable car. Mm -hmm. which uh, is the only big transport project that is actually financed. Mm -hmm. So uh, it took us about four years so far to design, engineer, uh, discuss with, the, with the, the mayor's office, and it has, it's been different mayors, so every mm -hmm. time we have to, to uh, explain, discuss, and, and see uh, yeah, how that to adapt. a lot. Yeah. It does happen <laughs> a lot. With the current mayor, we had a very early and good discussion on what he wants uh, mm -hmm. and, and how we, what, what, what we can deliver uh, on, on our side. Right. So end of next year, there would be a cable car from Khachorin uh, Market mm -hmm. to Yarmag. Uh, and and um, I hope that uh, the inhabitants of the city will be able to discover that it's very silent. It's mm -hmm. um, very quick. It's about 11 minutes. And if you do it on a bus now, mm -hmm. it's something between 45 minutes and three hours. I see. Uh, 11 minutes is quite short actually, of course. Uh, and we start to have requests of is people. Is this just the uh, first line or? It's the first line. Currently it's only one. It's the first line, we have a budget for a second line. Second line. Uh, we are in the middle of discussing what to do with the second line. My approach is start with the first line, people will see how mm -hmm. it works. Uh, my bet is they will love it they will see that it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's quick, it's silent, it's safe. Uh, it, it's the equivalent of maybe 80 buses. 80 buses, yeah. wow. That, that it's how, much, how many bus buses you need mm -hmm. for 45 minutes at least to, to cover that and go back. Right. Uh, and, and the footprint is very small because you mm -hmm. need one pylon every 100 meters, more or less. Mm -hmm. uh, and and these, these four kilometers will be actually quite, quite quick. 
So mm. yeah, I can't wait to see that happening. Uh, and, and the idea is it's, it's a part of the existing um, network of transport. So mm -hmm. this card here that works in buses mm -hmm. should also be working in the cable car. It's the same system. Um, the pricing will be de decided with the municipality, but there would be one more element for public transport here, hopefully less traffic jams, a bit less pollution. Mm -hmm. And think of how much time you, 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 you win, right? Yeah, of course. 30, 30 minutes every day in 30 minutes out, which you can spend studying, seeing people, working. One, one hour a day you yeah. save. It's back. a gift, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it's great. Can't wait to see it. Yeah, I, th I think I, I think will change, not massively, mm -hmm. uh, but it will be one more little step to show that things are improving, uh, that technology exists to make things easier, mm -hmm. uh, less polluting as well, uh, and and that is also the debate we just had recently on the uh, renewable energies. Uh, it's about mm -hmm. a, a policy decision that doesn't cost more than a bit of time, a bit of energy. And then you have private investors that can come in mm -hmm. and, and, and change things dramatically and mm -hmm. having an impact on health, on, on uh, energy sovereignty, uh, on how much energy this country needs to develop as well. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is one of the aspects, of course. Yeah, amazing. Okay, so maybe final words to wrap it up. Wrap it up, I've had no. I'll give you an opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's been three amazing years for me. I think it's been three important years in our relationship between France and Mongolia. But I think more important, it has been um, a very promising time for Mongolia. Now with the new government, new parliament, it's, it's a new, new chapter. I hope we can build on the existing dynamics, which are very strong. Make sure more is delivered, more and more is delivered for the population of Mongolia, for the partners, yeah. uh, and, and make sure Mongolia has more choices. I very much, very much believe in that sense of agency, mm -hmm. that you know, a society has to decide what they want to do themselves. It's not their neighbors or anyone else uh, who, who has to decide that. And, and Mongolia society is very able to do that, willing to do that. So how can we help and open up space, uh, open up options um, and then it's not up to me to decide which, which way it goes but I'm confident that um, Mongolia in a few years will be even more comfortable, more developed, uh, more, more open than it is now. Well thank you very much, it was a great pleasure to meet you today and have this opportunity to discuss about what you're doing here and to, you know, what you've done for our country, for, for our relationship for our people and I'm really impressed and thankful on behalf Thanks. of all of them and uh, just a few days before you leave Mongolia. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. It was really great pleasure. Thank you very much. And I really hope it's a new constitution, new parliament, is new rules, new regulations, new government. Everything is new. So I think it's a, it's a beginning of a lot of you mm. know, great stuff in terms of economic, social, changes in the country and uh, hopefully when you come back one day and we meet again have a coffee together with that's pleasure. it's gonna be a much better place for everyone to live thank you very yeah, much, thank it, was, you very much. You, it was a very nice moment thanks okay thank you i wish you good luck thanks thank you